Hello everyone and welcome to Dark Aspects, where I analyze a more adult side of Nintendo games. In the last video of this series, I reviewed Color Splash, but now I'm going back in time as I'd like to announce one video for each game of the original Paper Mario trilogy. Why not just do them all at this point? Well, it's best to not go digging in the trash now, is it? Honestly, Sticker Star is pretty exempt from dark aspects, but if I had to make a video, it'd be about one minute long and focus all around Mr. Blizzard's melting, because that was genuinely sad. Anyway, the first of this line of amazing games is Paper Mario on the N64, and it's my favorite in the series. Why not the fan favorite Thousand Year Door? That's a video for another time. We're here today to search under the radar and uncover the more mature themes this game presents. Chapter 3, The Invincible Tub of Blubba seems like it'd be a go-to section of the game for this sort of thing, but in actuality it starts off quite silly. Trekking through the Forever Forest certainly has a genuinely scary feel to it, though the Boo's Mansion is just a fun little classic haunted house that doesn't bode well in the realm of terror. The real creepy side of this chapter shines later when the threat is discovered. Tub of Blubba is a towering beast that eats Boo's whole which is frightening in itself because 1. it feasts on language-capable creatures, and 2. the monster completely swallows them face first. This story arc is appealing in mystery from the beginning, as the only way to beat him is to locate and defeat Tubba's heart. That's right, Mr. Blubba himself is simply a towering husk of an enemy a puppet to the brains, or heart in this case, of the operation. When you realize that bandaged patch on his chest is where his heart is supposed to be, it's disturbing to think about how exactly it became separated in the first place. It's true that magic exists in the game's universe, and it could have been teleported out via magic Koopa spell, but that doesn't explain any wound that needs covering. Was this a surgical procedure then? Considering Bowser is stated to be the one that made him invincible, we can probably assume it wasn't done in a clean way. As shocking as that might sound, regardless, having to sneak around and run from this giant puppet's chambers until its weakness is uncovered is one of the less tame events this game offers. I'd like to move focus quite a ways into the game from this point and discuss a segment of Chapter 6. Since then, Mario has had to face both a darkness-loving ghost and killer plants alike, but Dark Days in Sunflower Fields is the next big moment in terms of more adult content. In this chapter, the player gains access to a world in which every friendly character is a type of plant, meaning they all need the three types of basic nutrients, water, soil, and sunshine. Thankfully, the flowers can thrive here normally, but are missing the third major ingredient to their livelihood, that being the sun itself. Now, the reason the sun is missing is quite comical, as it's simply Bowser's minions meddling with a cloud-generating machine, but seeing the dejected and hopeless floral residence is quite sad. Mario can help each one out to make the situation a bit better, but none of them are truly happy until their star rises again. The situation becomes even more dire when the player actually meets the sun before destroying the Puff Puff machine, where a reflective tower climb invokes feelings of melancholy with this background theme. Seeing a completely sullen-faced sun, knowing it's letting down its people, is an impactful moment and perhaps one of the highlights when remembering mature moments in this adventure. On a side note, at the end of that chapter, Mario faces off against Huff and Puff himself, a sentient cloud that can break apart into tough puffs, creatures of his own species that he's willing to swallow up to restore health. After reviving our new friend and ridding the heavenly fields of an evil overcast, the penultimate chapter is granted access. So just what aspects lurk in a star spirit on ice? Well, perhaps most obvious involves acquiring the mayor of Shiver City's permission to progress. Unfortunately though, the mayor was supposedly murdered. The mayor's wife walks into the room upon Mario discovering his body and irrefutably believes her protagonist to be the cause. After dragging an investigator into this crime scene, Mario is accused but given the chance to prove himself innocent with evidence. This leads to a penguin murder mystery and sees the hero getting help from fictional horror writer Herringway to make sense of the commotion. Ultimately though, the fuss ends with the mayor simply waking up from his blackout, stating it's his fault and that his head was hit while reaching for a gift. While this was all built up for a joke, the humor comes from how shocking the situation was, everywhere from an actual killing to false accusations of a culprit. I want to also stress that until the punchline, players are left to believe he's dead, 
and that someone actually took this character's life in a Mario game. Not poofed away, canonically killed off. Alright, calming down a little bit, but also in this chapter is the Ice Palace Mario must explore. Progressing past the Bitter Mountain region leads the player to a lonely place, the Crystal Palace. This is revealed to have been a shrine to the star spirits Mario's been rescuing on his quest, so it's inherently off-putting as its history's been deserted. The music, Crystal Palace Crawl, is a tad unsettling to match the empty atmosphere. The Duplagos work to add to this dissonance when they pose as your friends. Other would-be enemies unique to this area are the albino dinos, completely harmless but somewhat creepy as these seemingly illusionary creatures are actually living guards for the palace. They strangely only move when interacted with too, and serve solely as a roadblock to puzzle intruders. To wrap up these chapter segments, this isn't necessarily dark, though I feel it's worth mentioning this iteration of Bowser's built to be a formidable villain. In games where the final boss is a one-on-one -on -one traditional Bowser vs Mario fight, that means no gimmicks like Dark Bowser, a team-up, or his being possessed, this is one of the best. I'd say Mario 64 is probably his outright scariest appearance, but for a dialogue-heavy game Bowser is made to be feared. This contrasts to Thousand Year Door, Super Paper Mario, and the earlier Mario & Luigi games in which he is utilized for comic relief. While he is still dim-witted and used for humor here as the tail end of jokes, he is capable, and moments like his castle first rising from below peaches was genuinely intimidating to see for the first time. While it's now a known trope, hopeless boss fight, it works to have Mario lose at the beginning because it's something players hardly ever get to see from this franchise. Bowser, written to have remembered his previous losses from Mario, comes out on top and actually believes he'll prevail this time with a solid plan. Of course, he's stomped as per usual, but it was an effort by the devs to make him less foolish in a Mario role-playing game. The only other enemies I'd consider frightening would be the black-cloaked anti-guys, a variant of Shy Guy more powerful than even their commander, General Guy, to the extent that their other Elias is Deadly Guy. They're one of the strongest non-boss enemies in the game, made especially scary by the fact that if you lose the quiz held in Bowser's castle, Mario's pitted against a trio of them called the Anti-Guy Unit. To finish off in a lighter way, and look at the game as a whole, let's discuss some of the sexual references that make their way into this E-rated game. As part of a chain of side quests revolving around completing favors for the old man Koopa Koot, the third task is to retrieve a borrowed tape from Goompa and Goomba Village. Just what's on the tape? It's never stated, but it's clear the contents aren't something either party wants to make obvious. Koopa Koot makes Mario promise to keep the ordeal under wraps, and Goompa becomes noticeably flustered when asked, admitting he can't reveal that information at the moment, probably because his wife is there and it's porn. It was great though. Similarly, there's a scene at the end of Chapter 3 during the Peach interlude. It involves a nervous hammer bro asking what the player is looking at, and that he isn't searching for the book you think he's looking for. After a haphazard excuse, he gives the player a shooting star item to essentially bribe them into leaving. And that's all I have for the original Paper Mario. Next time I'll be discussing the much edgier Thousand Year Door with things like drug and gang war undertones. There's a noose in the town square. Need I say more? Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.